can get in there. Um, <clears throat> vast majority of bites are from our pets, cats and dogs. Um, kind of the, the bacteria that's involved kind of depends upon what's in the oral flora of the animal. Um, it can also be, you know, our own skin contamination, feces, soil, that sort of a thing from the animal. Our cat bites and human bites have a lot more propensity to become secondarily infected versus dog bites. <clears throat> so that's kind of important when you're wondering whether you should give prophylactic antibiotic, for instance. Um, you always need to think about what kind of animal the bite uh, was caused by, where the bite happened, um, and any type of, of secondary injury, if it's involving a, a joint space or something like that. Hand bites are particularly concerning, um, and probably any hand bite you're going to put on prophylactic antibiotic, um, whether it looks, you know, infected or not. All right, um, so most of the bites are, animal bites are from dogs, or pets mainly. Um, as, as you know, I had the dog bite, accidental dog bite I told you about where I had to get 15 stitches. And it says here, so most like kids get the, the facial bites, I, so I was acting like a little uh, four-year-old <laughs> on the ground with the dogs, but Usually, in adults, it tends to be more involvement of the upper extremity and hands. Um, the little kiddos, because they're down, bothering them when they're sleeping or eating, things like that. Um, it's more on the head and, head and neck area. Um, <clears throat> so, um, again, only about 5 to 20 percent of, of dog bites actually become infected. Um, 30 to 50 percent of cat bites become infected. Again, you need to be particularly concerned for uh, the hands, the extremities, and we have such an ample blood supply to uh, the head, neck, and face area, so those tend to, to not become infected as much as your extremities. The most common isolate from cat bites is Pasteurella species, and you need to know that. That has been on my pants, panra exams um, at some point, I know, so you have to know that word or know that term. 50% of dogs, but it's primarily in cats. Um, and you don't really need to know those other bacteria that can cause that, cause, can cause secondary infections, but know that Pasteurella. The thing about Pasteurella is it, is it comes on really, really quickly. Um, you're going to start seeing infection developing 8 to 24 hours after the bite, where normal other bacteria take several days for that to happen. So that's kind of a, a, can give you a clue as to what, what bacteria it might be. <clears throat> you always need to look and see, you know, is the bite involving uh, the bone underneath or um, the joint. There is a variant, um, the, I can't pronounce it, but that cat no sight Cytophagia, that one, you don't really need to know it. That's, that's, it's kind of on the rise. You tend to see that more causing more severe illness, especially in, in immunocompromised people. But uh, you don't need to know it for my exam. All right, human bites. Um, you know, you're going to see this when people get into fist fights. Um, medical personnel, unfortunately, <laughs> domestic abuse, things like that, especially when you see it over the knuckles like that, closed fist, um, accidental, you know, hits the tooth and breaks the skin. Um, this is, tends to be um, a diverse 
flora, bacteria, but I want you to know the strep viridans. Be familiar with that. That's the most common one. You can not only just your routine bacteria, but you always have to think about tetanus, hepatitis, hepatitis, um, herpes simplex, things like that. With any bites, you have to, have to, have to ask about their tetanus and booster them if, if they haven't, if they're not up to date. Obviously, get an ortho hand surgeon or orthopedics involved if there's um, injury deeper down into the, to the joint or involving the tendon. Probably you should know that. One of the reasons why cat bites are so much more prominent to cause infection is because they tend to be more of a deeper puncture wound versus like a, a tearing or, um, or more of a laceration. Those puncture wounds where that bacteria is seated deeper down into the tissue is, is where that can be a problem. So make sure you document um, what type of wound, the depth of it, uh, and make sure you, you look and document for any other involvement with joints, tendons, bone, anything like that. You probably want to consider getting a picture of it and putting it in the chart. <laughs> 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 that startled me. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm no worries. If the wound looks infected, say if they've come in, you know, several days after the fact and the wound looks infected, you'll want to get a, uh, excuse me, a culture then for sure. Um, you know, if they came in the very same day or within a few minutes to hours after the bite, it probably getting a, a culture is, would be pointless, so I, I wouldn't mess with that. But you're going to treat empirically if, if indicated. You definitely want to vigorously clean and irrigate these wounds out. I remember when I went in with my nose, uh, you know, they had the big syringe and was just irrigating. I thought I was, it was like waterboarding. <laughs> it was just, I thought I was going to drown. It was horrible. But, <clears throat> all right, do you, do you close these wounds? Um, do you not close these wounds? I would, it's kind of controversial. I would say if you have um, a, for cosmetic purposes on the face, um, in, especially since they tend to not become secondarily infected as, as easily, you probably are going to think about closing those. Other ones, unless if they're just gaping, I would probably try to leave those open. Um, again, anytime you close that up, uh, you're increasing the risk of secondary infection. Don't ever suture uh, cat wounds closed. If, there, if, you know, if it's a puncture wound, you're probably not going to be much to, to suture. But. <coughs> All right, so prophylaxis antibiotic, you want to for sure do your high risk or start that on your high-risk patients. Any cat bites, hand bites, uh, animal or human, just anything on the hand, I would uh, prophylactically start antibiotics. Uh, if a person has other comorbidities, if they're diabetic, they're asplenic, they've had their spleen removed, liver disease, things like that. So you don't necessarily need to start every single person on one. I, I have kind of an idea of who I would be starting on prophylactic antibiotics and not. Your augmentin is your number one antibiotic of choice. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about rabies. Thank goodness we don't see rabies a whole lot anymore. This is basically a progressive infectious disease that affects the central nervous system. And it is essentially deadly um, if, if not treated. 
this is spread via the saliva of an animal vector. <clears throat> you see this a lot more worldwide. Um, and wild animals are the by far the more common vector versus our domesticated <clears throat> animals, again, because they get um, should be getting their immunizations for that. <clears throat> Um, within the United States, your raccoons, skunks, bats, and foxes are your most common. Here in Oklahoma, skunks are your number one vector. I hate skunks. <laughs> Have your animals ever been shot by skunks? It's the worst, isn't it? Well, my dog has been hit three different times, and it's just the god awful smell. Uh, and it just lingers for months. It's horrible. Okay, so this is a viral infection. Um, <clears throat> there are two main uh, genera or of the Rhabdoviridae um, virus. Those two, you don't necessarily need to know those, but be a little familiar with them. <clears throat> rabies is there is a very long incubation period so that's a good thing um, incubation period before it starts showing any signs and symptoms is can be up to three months so you've got a time in there to get treatment and the good thing is is that you know with that long incubation period is that that tends to stay very close to the wound where the bite occurred rather than goodness. <laughs> system. Um, it can cause acute encephalitis. I do want you to for sure know negri bodies on um, histology. If you get a biopsy um, of tissue, infected tissue, it will show these particular bodies which are eosinophilic inclusion bodies um, within cells where that virus replicates. Um, and that, if you if a, if the pathologist sees these, that is pathognomonic for rabies. So make sure you are familiar with that term. Now, if you don't see them, it doesn't exclude the disease. Used. But if you do see it, it's a slam dunk. <clears throat> Two forms of rabies. You've got your encephalitic or your furious type of rabies, that's by far the more common, and then you have your paralytic or also kind of known as dumb or apathetic rabies, that's about 20%. So they're kind of polar opposites as to how they present. The encephalitic or the furious tends to have kind of a, uh, an exaggerated uh, hyperexcitability, uh, disorientation, hallucinations, bizarre behavior. Um, hypersalivation, so that's when you're going to see the, you know, the, the drooling, the body temperature goes up, high, high, fast heart rate, hypertension, that sort of thing, cardiac arrhythmias. The paralytic um, is where you get kind of a numbness and unable to move initially in that, that limb that was bitten, assuming it's a, a limb. And then you tend to get the, the difficulty moving all four um, extremities. And either one can progress, will progress to, to coma and then death. Some other unique clinical presentations with rabies um, that about 50% of patients will present with is uh, hydrophobia, 
that's where they get, uh, when they're drinking fluids, they'll get uh, spasms of the pharynx and larynx and the diaphragm. And that this can also happen with air in their face, called aerophobia. So those same features with um, stimulation from a draft of air. So again, within 10 days, a person will usually be in a coma. So that is quick. Again, slow incubation period, but boy, once you start seeing symptoms, it's a quick downhill um, progression. And death is guaranteed. That's basically, you may have kind of a prodrome of, you know, malaise, lethargy, headache, fever, nausea, vomiting, um, and then you get into more your specific neurological um, presentation, and then coma, and then death. Within a, less than two weeks, that's kind of scary. The thing about this is there's not really any fantastic work up for it either. Um, your CT, your MRI, your cerebral spinal fluid, your lab work, all that's going to essentially be normal. During that incubation period, there's really no diagnostic test. <clears throat> now, once, once you, a person has symptoms, um, that's when you can start detecting antibody in the, in the blood. And, and body. Um, one thing I want you to know there, again, usually if you get the animal, they're going to euthanize the animal and then get a biopsy probably from the brain tissue because that's where it's going to be the most prominent. They're not going to, you know, if you go in with a, a bite, <laughs> they're not going to get a biopsy from your brain. Um, what they're going to do is it likes to, to the, the antigen, you tend to see it more at the base of hair follicles, so they tend to get the biopsy down here at the nape of the neck. I would just kind of be familiar with that. I don't think I have a specific test question on that. but um. Have to have to clean that wound. You know, it's vital. Tetanus prophylaxis, if they're up to date on tetanus, make sure to get them updated. Unfortunately, there's not a good treatment. Um, so we need to be ahead of the ball game. You know, if there's a bite, um, you need to see if you can get the animal. If they can get the animal, they can observe the animal. Um, to, to look for signs of, of infection, rabies infection with the animal, or they can euthanize the animal and get more specific testing done. Um, but you're going to treat, if at all, suspicious. One important thing is steroids are contraindicated. Okay. You don't want to, if you're suspicious of, of you have a bite, you just, you don't put them on steroids. Um, what the steroids can do is it will shorten that incubation period um, and it will then increase mortality. So that's a big no-no. All right, so this is a fatal disease unless if we treat with post-exposure therapy early in the incubation period. All right, so post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP. Um, you know, with a, a domesticated animal, you can kind of determine, you know, is it a provoked, is it non-provoked? But with a wild animal, I don't think you can really use that judgment. Um, so I, if it were me, I'm going to assume any wild animal is, is rabid. Um, until proven otherwise. This is a, you have to report this to the Oklahoma Health Department. And you basically give passive and active immunization. Okay, the passive 
is the immunoglobulin, human rabies immune globulin. Um, and that's where you're just passing on the <coughs> antibodies passively before a person's own body can start developing antibodies with the um, active immunization. So there, there are two forms of the passive immunity. It's immogram and hyperrab. <clears throat> um, one thing that's kind of important about this, the, the dosing is there. You don't need to know that dosing. You can always look that up. Um, but one important thing is that you don't want to give this any later than seven days after the first active immunization. Because after that, the body is starting to develop its own antibodies, and by giving antibodies, it, it will diminish our body's response to that, to, to making its own antibodies. So you don't want to diminish the body's immunity. We have two um, rabies vaccinations, Imovax and Rabavert. And that is four separate one mil dosing. It's in the intramuscular deltoid region, not the not the gluteal. Day zero three seven fourteen. If uh, you have an immunocompromised person, you're going to give them an extra dosage. You're going to give them five dosages. <coughs> Now, if a per same person works at the zoo or something like that, and they have already been um, immunized, so to speak, you, then you don't need to give them the immunoglobulin. You never give the two immunizations in the same uh, vaccine or same syringe. And if a person is pregnant, you still treat them. It's not a contraindication. I'll let you kind of read through that. Just the algorithm, basically what we've talked about. All right, so people that um, work their occupation, like at the zoo or Bob Life Center or something like that where they're at high risk, um, there is a pre-exposure rabies vaccination that is three doses, to, doses of that vaccine on day 0, 7, 21, or 28. Again, you don't need to know those, um, those regimens, some of the big, bigger points I want you to know. Questions about animal bites, human bites, rabies? Yeah. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Last time I just learned um, in infectious disease that in Oklahoma, if you see a storm during the daytime, you're actually supposed to call the police because the rabies virus affects their brain so that they only come out at the daytime if they're infected, or the kids are more likely, I should say. Interesting, because so they're normally the nocturnal. Huh? You should actually call the police. Really? Um, you know, else Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah. Good to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she knew they were normally not. Oh, that's good, good information. And since they're the number one cause, especially here in Oklahoma. <laughs> okay, let's talk about spider bites, which I really, really hate. Ugh, I do not like spiders. Okay, so most spiders don't even have fangs that are big enough or long enough to penetrate our skin. But there's about a hundred that, that can. Um, there are two primarily that we're concerned about that can cause um, severe enough symptoms. <clears throat> Normally, you're just going to get uh, you know some localized redness, pain, itching, burning sensation. If you can all at all get a spider, if a person can get a spider, take it in with them, um, that is really, really helpful. All right, so the two that we're concerned about um, is the black widow, and bless you, and the brown recluse. 
and um, again, I'm not good at pronouncing these. But you might just be kind of familiar with the the condition, the health condition that that each one can potentially cause if if a person is bitten by it. The black widow spider is the lacrodectism, and the brown recluse is that loxosolism, whatever. <laughs> be familiar with that, recognize it. Alright, so Black Widow. Um, it's everywhere, especially the southeastern United States. Both of these spiders really don't like people. They, they um, hide out in dark private areas. The Black Widow is a black shiny spider and it has on the, the <coughs> ventral abdomen, the bottom of their abdomen, or their underside, I guess I should say, um, has this red hourglass marking. <coughs> so you can't see it when it's, you know, up and walking. You have to turn it on its back. Um, female spiders are more potent. And we are right in that season when you tend to see them. Uh, you may not even, with really with either one of these bites, the patient may not even realize they were bitten or it may just <coughs> have a, a sharp pinprick but oftentimes it goes unnoticed. All right, so this one, Black Widow, contains a toxin that mainly causes muscle cramping. Um, at the bite of the site, site of the bite, rather, <laughs> um, and can also involve the extremities and the trunk. Abdomen, the abdomen is what you hear of the most. And this can stick around for several weeks. You can also get some other things, uh, increased salivation, increased tearing of the eyes, diaphoresis, <coughs> urination, defecation, stomach upset, vomiting. Very rarely um, you can get uh, renal failure and rhabdomyolysis with that. But it tends to be more in, again, either extreme. You're very young or you're very old. Unfortunately, with either one of these bites, we don't have good, good treatments for it, really and truly. This one, you just kind of have to um, treat symptomatically. Uh, as far as where the, the bite occurs, you just kind of want to you know, rest the area, maybe put ice on it, compression and, and elevation. Um, for sure, tetanus prophylaxis with any of these. If the muscle cramping is severe, um, then you may need to admit for pain control and maybe IV benzodiazepines just to calm those muscle spasms down. There is an antivenom, but it's not really used very much as far as I could tell um, and there is concern that it can have a hypersensitivity reaction to it so again in your middle-aged healthy person you're not going to use it you're just going to let let it pass uh, but you might consider it again in the very old or very young and that is what that nasty thing looks like <laughs> Does anybody like spider? I hate them. I just get goosebumps every time I do this. And there's that hourglass that you can see. I think I've seen one of these. They're they're pretty decent size. Have you guys seen one? You did? How big was it? Side to the garage door. Uh, yeah, that's the when you, cut, when you like broom it or whatever to get rid of 
that it like crackles. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's organized. Like okay. Okay. We'll stay away from You don't come in my house. Yeah. <laughs> Brown recluse. Um, all right, we definitely have these around here, South Central United States. So this one's a dark brown. This one really doesn't tend to get very big. Um, has a violin shape on the cephalothorax, so kind of that mid portion just below the head. It's also called a fiddleback because of that shape of the fiddle of the violin. And the um, the neck of the violin points towards the abdomen, so that helps. Another clue to help you recognize this spider, most spiders have eight or four pairs of eyes, eight eyes all together. Um, brown recluse only has six eyes. Yeah, I just want to get that close to be able to determine how many pair, pairs of eyes it has. So again, this and or this animal, this insect is not aggressive, generally aggressive towards they're not going to come chase us down. Um, but if we put a shirt on or a shoe on with and they're in there, um, bless you, goodness, today, um, they are going to respond with a with a bite. The active enzymes that break the, you know, cause that necrotic or necrosis of the skin is the sphingomyelinase. <laughs> uh, be familiar with that, but again. So the large, large, large majority of brown recluse bites are nothing. They just get a local redness, irritation, burning. Um, itching, things like that, swelling. Um, occasionally, they can get much more severe to the point of necrosis of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And can even sometimes rarely cause systemic symptoms such as uh, hemolysis, the breakdown of our red blood cells. Okay, so again, oftentimes people don't even know they got bit. Um, the thing about this too is this progresses quickly. Um, so if a person comes in, you know, two weeks after a bite, they're like, oh, this is red and inflamed. Is this a, a brown recluse? It could be, but it's not going to become all necrotic and, you know, that sort of a thing. So it, it happens fairly quickly. <clears throat> so you initially get redness. Um, uh, induration, central induration, you get zones of pale skin where it's ischemic as well as, as red skin, erythematous. And then it becomes more ecomotic almost um, and hemorrhagic with, with blisters. And then that will form a thick eschar or a thick scab and then that will slough and then you have this ulceration and that will leave a scar because that's that's deep. So about 50% of people in addition to these skin changes will get fever and, and um, fever and chills within three days. Again the systemic variant um, you tend to get renal failure, rhabdomyolysis, breaking down of the muscle tissue and intravascular hemolysis, so the breakdown of cells. I think too you can have some liver involvement if I'm not mistaken. So um, if you're worried about that, you definitely want to get a CBC CMP to, to watch your liver and your kidneys as well as your red blood cells and that sort of thing. So again, this is going to occur 24 to 72 hours after the bite, so pretty quick. One thing, um, initial management, you want to use that rice technique. Um, in, however, elevation, I probably would recommend elevation um, because that encourages that, that to go you know, back to the heart. You want to keep it more localized as best you can. 
Um, you don't want to put heat on it because that tends to encourage the spreading of that. Put ice um, and, and rest it. Just rest. Try not to move it very much. Again, they have done studies all over the place as to how do we best treat these and we just do not have good options. Um, in clinic, we would see a number of, of I never I have never seen a bad, bad brown recluse bite in, in clinic. I have seen some that have been probably, um, and they were starting to have some of that um, uh, ischemic and, and echomotic appearance, but it hadn't necrosed and become, gotten an eschar or anything like that. What we would do um, is we would uh, pull up some steroid, some prednisone, and inject, you know, multiple areas kind of around the outer indurated portion to just call, try to calm everything down so it didn't progress. <clears throat> so they've studied a lot of things. Um, we don't have antivenom here in the United States. So be familiar with how each one of these bites may potentially present. The, the muscle cramping versus the necrotic <clears throat> tissue and the potential systemic involvement with the brown hook. So here's your fiddle back. You can see that <coughs> fiddle there uh, just below the head with the pointing, whatever, the neck pointing towards the abdomen. And there you have those six eyes instead of eight eyes. Yeah, I'm not going to get that close to check, check their vision. <laughs> okay, and here's kind of day three, day four, five, that necrotic. So I've seen some start that looked like on day three or day four, but I they never progressed that I saw to, to like what looks on day ten. Thank the Lord. But I've heard about some bad ones. Have you guys had friends or yeah? I had a faculty member die from a brown and close fight. He got the hemolytic anemia. You're and all kidding that. me. Um, like wow. Failure. That's crazy. A girl I played softball with, her mom was a bit on the calf and she almost lost her entire calf from it because it was so necrotic. Wow. She's just horribly scarred and disfigured mm -hmm. from it. If you look at her legs, it's like, it almost looks like somebody just removed her entire muscle. Like she her skin looks fine. She bite or something. fine. But yeah, her muscle's just gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any others? Yeah. I have a friend who's actually bit last week and she's 36 years pregnant and she's been her belly. Oh. So she's going in every day to have an ultrasound done and it's just like they're measuring it and everything. So it's that's very scary. But she's doing us. How far out is she? She's like 36 weeks pregnant. I mean, how far out from the bike? Oh gosh, four days now. It's looking better that she's not gonna. She's not actually worried. It's not antibiotics. Most of the time, people do. Uh, you know, we prescribe way too many antibiotics. Um, if you have the toxin, that antibiotic, and you're going to do the squat, um, but just prophylactically, I suppose. Yeah. Do you have any idea how much the antitoxins cost? Because I know antivenoms can be like stupidly I'm expensive. I'm sure they're stupidly expensive, but I have no idea. Okay. I could maybe find that out for you, but yeah, I'm sure they're crazy, crazy expensive. Okay, I know we've talked a lot uh, at nauseam about uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, so we'll just kind of review here. Um, this is the, the strain of staph aureus that's developed resistance to your penicillins and your cephalosporins. What? Bless you! <laughs> it's my perfume or something. <laughs> so we have your hospital acquired. MRSA and your community acquired MRSA. Hospital acquired, you know, is typically usually associated with your immunocompromised, your 
ill, debilitated people, people that have had some kind of a procedure, um, potentially, um, can cause pneumonia. We talked about that way back in, in pulmonary. A um, uh, person becomes septic, endocarditis, that sort of thing. Um, back in the 90s is when we started it moved from the hospital setting out into the community. Um, and that's when you started seeing people with these boils. Um, you know, the community acquired is, is a pyogenic, a skin infection primarily. <clears throat> boils, deep abscesses, and cellulitis can potentially cause some lethal infections such as necrotizing fasciitis, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. I was kind of surprised about this, and I, ch I checked that this data, the 2%, less than 2% population colonized with MRSA. I would have suspected that to be way higher than that, but um, yeah, that's what, the, that's what they're saying, is less than 2%. I imagine that 2% is <laughs> work in the healthcare field, or wrestlers or something like that where they're just expected. <coughs> um, your hospital acquired is typically going to, you know, again, they're going to be more ill, more sick, um, going to typically be treated with your IV vancomycin <coughs> and probably have precautions, contact precautions. Anybody entering the room will have to gown up, maybe even uh, uh, put a, a mask on and then dispose of those before they leave. And your community acquired, again, is more of the skin infections or with red swelling, painful skin lesions that form abscesses. And again, with the skin lesions, the community acquired, your IND is your main thing you want to do. Open it up and drain it. And that's oftentimes all you have to do. Now, people who are at, have other comorbidities, you know, they're immunosuppressed, they're diabetic, um, they're on immunosuppressants, things like that. Uh, you're going to start an antibiotic, or, or I think if you have a healthy person, but they have just multiple, multiple lesions, or if it's in an area that you know, I don't know, the groin area, or the hand, or the face, or something like that. Um, good antibiotics for that are your. Trim sulfa, but you know how I feel about trim sulfa. <laughs> Your doxycycline and men minocycline. Clindamycin, um, you yeah, know, that's becoming less and less. They're finding a lot more um, resistance with clindamycin, so it probably would be my first go to. Your cephalosporins, your fluoroquinolones, your amoxicillins, they are not going to be good choices. <coughs> Uh, when you have a person, it's quite common to, you know, if you have become colonized and you have one of these lesions, these abscesses, it's pretty common to develop other ones in the future. Um, and if you have a person that's doing that, presenting like that, then you're going to want to treat them as well as probably their, their housemates, household members, with, um, again, you tend to carry that bacteria up in the nasal area as well as body creases. So I may have them treat with mupirocin, the topical antibiotic. Uh, apply this twice a day for a week, one week out of every month. Do that for several months in a row, say three or four months in a row, and then maybe back down as needed. But, and then use antibacterial washes. And you have seen this 18,000 times. But that's a pretty textbook. Questions about that? Yeah. I know that a lot of times um, staph infections and cytobites get easily confused. Do you have clinical advice for us on that? Can I tell you um, I think bio, or excuse me, uh, culture. Uh, I know back in the 90s when I mistook it because I didn't even know there was such a thing as community-acquired staff. Um, 
and so I was just treating it as a boil and uh, or a spider bite actually and um, so yeah I think you know see if you can get any history of did you see a spider uh, maybe the time of year um, if there's just one or multiples if you're at all concerned I would probably go ahead and start them on an antibiotic um, and then or IND it if you can and then wait for the wait for the culture results okay necrotizing fasciitis this is a very severe deep infection of the fascia and uh, the subcutaneous tissue. There are two types. Type 1 tends to be polymicrobial, anaerobes and um, aerobes. And this is by far the more common. <coughs> the person usually gets this secondary to something, a surgery, uh, trauma that breaks the skin or a penetrating trauma. Um, IV drug use, something like that. Now there is a variant that I want you to be familiar with called Fournier's gangrene, which involves it's it's a fasciitis, necrotizing fasciitis, but it involves the perineal and groin region, and it is it's bad. It's it's the mortality rate is incredibly high. Type two. Um, is where it's just a single bacteria such as group A strep or MRSA. People with diabetes and peripheral vascular disease are at much greater risk of this, especially with that Fournier's. I know diabetics are at a lot greater risk of getting that Fournier's gangrene. So this is a very rapid progression of redness, induration, uh, swelling, can develop ecchymosis, that, that look of a bruise with bullae on top, and then progresses to necrosis and gangrene. One thing I think that is kind of important to note is that it, what you see on the skin surface doesn't look as severe as what's going on underneath the skin surface. So it can be very misleading. So if you have a person who looks very, very sick, has a very high fever, um, I mean horrible pain, and it doesn't even look that bad, then you have to think about this. Uh, because there's probably more going on deeper underneath the skin than what you can see and appreciate. As the disease progresses, you tend to just lose feeling of that area because that infarction you just infarct those cutaneous nerves so it's almost like a severe burn like a third degree burn where you just don't have sensation to that area so the main thing you want that is of utmost importance when you consider uh, necrotizing fasciitis is to get them into the operating room and to open this up open open it up, excise the dead tissue, and that way you can get a deep, a very deep tissue biopsy that you can send for culture. Just getting a superficial biopsy or culture will do nothing. Will give you no information, valuable information. So on the, you know, you're obviously going on, you have breakdown necrosis of the fat tissue, vasculitis, inflammation of the vascular, the, uh, the veins and, and blood vessels down there, and local hemorrhage. Your MRI, CT, ultrasound really aren't going to give you too much information. So as quickly as you can get them in the emergency room, preferably within 24 hours, get them in the OR and get that, you know, have them seen by a, a general surgeon and get that opened up. And they typically will need to go in for repeated, um, 
what am I trying to say, uh, INDs, where you're just debriding all that dead necrotic tissue out. you have that dead necrotic tissue in there, it's just not going to heal up and you just have to get it out. You need to get antibiotics on board as quickly as you can. Again, don't wait for your, your culture results to come back. Get them on a broad spectrum antibiotic that covers both the uh, aerobics and, and anaerobic. They're, yeah, hyperbaric oxygen treatment you may consider, you know, I, I don't think they have real solid evidence in the research. It kind of went back and forth. There were some that said, yeah, it can be very helpful. Others said, no, not so much. So yeah, I imagine each place, each individual facility or provider kind of has his or her own take on it and an idea about that. Uh, an important thing, too, is going to be if insurance covers it or not. So this will oftentimes lead to death. The mortality rate is 20 to 50 percent of people that get this. Um, leads to shock and multi-organ system. Bless you. Multi-organ failure. And there it is. That looks like it's on the back of the leg. Uh, but you can see that ecomotic tissue is probably very hard and integrated and just that necrotic tissue. That's probably later in the later in the um, presentation. It's probably been going on for a little bit. I think that's it. Cool.